What does the price of tea in China have to do with the price of tea in America? It's really interesting. And I know you're asking this because I studied economics. Yes. Um, and that has to do with the difference in the supply and chain um, regarding where it's shipped from and then kind of that natural disposition of a certain given economy to the goods and services that they best produce. Wow. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Thanks for smelling the tea. Of course. There's one thing we do very well. I don't know if I can tell you or not. There's a city called Boston, right? So they, they had this tea party. Mm-hmm. Huge spectacle. Like it started out this very small little like small group thing, but it like it got out of hand real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually, so I went to Boston in college and not for college. I was on a men's course tour. Okay. And so we get dropped off uh, on our bus and we're right by the harbor. And I, before we left our hotel, I actually went to like the Continental breakfast and I grabbed a couple of bags of tea. Mm-hmm. And so when we got dropped off there, I knew I was going to find it to go look for it anyway, but then we got dropped off right there. So like I go, I get, you know, a picture taken and whatnot. And I just start chucking my tea bags into the Harbor. Right. And other people saw it and they were like, they were like losing their minds. I'm like, this is not the first time this has happened. People. This well, is a how do you think this harbor in particular? Yeah, this yeah, this is a hundred. This is a hundred fifty year uh, re- uh, very very poor budget reenactment of. But anyway, hey, thank you all for uh, tuning in right now. Uh, welcome to the Destination Podcast. Uh, you know me already, unfortunately. Uh, but with me today is the very funny Caitlin Minoski. Um, you can catch her all over the greater Columbus area doing shows. And, uh, actually I know we're on one coming up. We've been on one. Um, now I want to go ahead and, and, uh, ask you, so what got you started in, in comedy? So the first interest I ever had in comedy, I loved stand up when I was a kid, I would actually reenact stand-up specials for my friends in elementary school like i had jim gaffigan's beyond the pale memorized Mm -hmm. from beginning to front and i loved doing those impressions and then a teacher of mine in high school was like have you ever considered writing your own jokes instead of i don't know memorizing 40 hours of somebody else's material and that seed was planted and did not bloom until about eight years later in college Mm -hmm. when a friend of mine was going to start the stand-up comedy club at my university. I went to school in Chicago, big improv city. Yes. Not a lot of stand up on campus. We had probably about a dozen house teams for improv, but no stand up. And so that was the first opportunity I had to try to write and perform. I did about two student showcases and then I graduated. I tried again March of 2020 with a stand up competition in Newark. That quickly ended. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you were familiar with um, a certain pancetta, panini, um, Panasonic. The, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Panasonic, yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, and so that was on a hiatus. And then I've tried in earnest April of 2021, and I've continued to do it since. So still very fresh to this. Yeah, I, because uh, I, uh, when we did our show um, in the end of September, I was, you know, telling the other comics on the show uh, who weren't privy to you. And they were like, wow, you just like let this newbie on, uh, you know, for, for 10, 15 minutes. And I was like, well, she's not new. And I had, I had to explain to them that like, no, actually you started right in New York, but I did not know that you actually started even in Chicago though. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll say, uh, so did, am I, am I picking up correctly that you actually were on improv teams as well before you did stand up? I never did improv. I auditioned for several of the house teams at my university, okay. did not make any of them. Um, being 18, I was like, well, that's it. I'm just, I'm just not funny. Um, <laughs> and I shelved that idea. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to do stand up in the stand up club. And that was exactly the kind of soft launch I needed because I was mm-hmm. very, nervous about public speaking and that was just 15 other people that just happened to meet in one room in the science building once a week and i was like oh this i this i can do i did two student showcases my best story from that is we had one showcase on parents weekend 
So there were a bunch of parents on campus and I was the only one that did a clean set. So you had a lot of parents that were like tense yeah, it, the it, entire yeah. time. Um, I got up, this one woman in the front was just like <laughs> holding her daughter. <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, and then my set ended and she just goes, oh, okay. No one made a joke about their period. All right. And then yeah. it was back to that. Right back, after the, right back to dick jokes. Right back to Yeah. It. Yeah. Um, I, so I actually uh, also got my, I, I did my very first ever stand up set also in college. It was a one night stand. And it was in our student union. That I went to Bowling Green. Mm -hmm. And I was with a couple of my friends that were, they, they were freshmen that they did get on an improv team. Now, I would have auditioned had I known when the audition was. Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, I didn't realize that there were improv uh, groups. Um, and I also, was just, I didn't realize there would be any kind of outlet for improv or stand-up comedy or anything like that. Uh, because I was too busy, uh, you know, chasing women, <laughs> not chasing them literally in the, in the figurative sense. Yes. Um, I was like, that would be terrifying. <laughs> no, um, no BG is a very small town. I mean, yeah, yeah. fish in a barrel and, and, and not a lot of steps or hills to worry about too. That's just like a, it's like a track at that point. You're chasing women. PR <laughs> would be at Bowling Green, <laughs> but it was, they just did this one random, uh, give it a try, open mic kind of thing. And a friend of mine went on from the improv team. He did well. I went up there. I, I got about three minutes in and it was, and all of a sudden the power went out in the whole building. And I like, I, I just, I shout immediately. I'm like, I didn't realize I was killing this hard, you know? <laughs> And uh, no, that was that was God's sign that I was never meant to do stand up. So I didn't do it for a while. Um, and I, I wanted to ever since I was a kid, since I was like 13. And I saw Eddie Murphy's uh, Raw for the first time. Oh, hell yeah. and, uh, and and people talk about that whole like Bob Saget effect mm -hmm. about like knowing him um, from Full House and then hearing his stand up and like, Wow, he's not a wholesome dad at all. He's a deplorable, filthy pervert. Like, mm -hmm. so you know, obviously people would have the same effect because I knew Eddie Murphy mm -hmm. as one Doctor Doolittle from mm -hmm. the classic, and uh, also from Shrek as Donkey. So picturing Donkey, but while I'm hearing what Eddie's saying back in like you know 1980s, and it should have had the Bob Saget effect on me. It didn't. It almost enhanced it. Like just hearing like donkey do these like, you know, like Bill Cosby and Mr. T and Richard Pryor impersonations. Like that sold it for me. But no, I, I so I always wanted to do it. Again, I had my one time that, you know, uh, God cut off my lights and mic. So then it wasn't until about 2018. Um uh, yeah, somewhere in March, I I watched uh, Doug Stanhope's uh, Beer Hall Push special, and that was like seeing just how little he cared about any kind of fame or money or anything like that. I mean, this is a, this is a guy saying just this most outlandish stuff that would never make it on TV or anything like that. So that's what did it for me, and then it got me to my first open mic, and then mm -hmm. here I am in my living room doing a podcast with you. So. It's funny that you mentioned the Eddie Murphy and donkey thing. I once watched it with the closed captions on mm -hmm. and you can actually under his breath, he says like, God damn a lot. Mm -hmm. And I saw that as the caption is like, Oh my gosh, I never would have heard that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of that in yeah. that character too. Yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, they couldn't keep that obviously, even though, you know, the, the, the first, the first Shrek movie, was just this giant middle finger to Disney mm -hmm. to just again just the the formula for fairy tales in a whole, mm -hmm. um, all the little adult jokes slipping in like it's it's a it's it it, it it's like I don't want to say it didn't know what it was trying to be because it really was it was trying to be a kids movie for adults. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't exactly an adult movie for kids, but it was a kids movie mm -hmm. for adults, uh, which is why it still holds up. Whenever you watch it, 
mm-hmm. all these years later. And you'll, you know, you'll pick up a few here and there now, um, even though some of the references are even to this day or even back then dated. Mm-hmm. But no, I anyone listening to this knows that should know by now my love of the Shrek movies. But I was going to say, I don't mean to keep adding to the, the Shrek conversation, but what kills me most is go that on. that was the that was where animators had to go and they had to work on Shrek yes. when they got kicked off of Prince of Egypt. Egypt. And I love yes. that so much because Absolutely. which movie do I revisit annually? It's not Prince of not Egypt. Prince of Egypt. It, yeah. Yeah. I absolutely love that. And then when you like, when you actually like uh, look at a picture of the guy that Farquaad is based yes. off of, like right away, when you watch Shrek, you're like, wow, one of these characters, they spent so much time and effort to make look like a human. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, they, you know, the fact that they made his size, the made they, the fact they made his name sound a little bit like a certain explicit uh, epithet. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Have you seen the video with Cameron Diaz watching it back? And there's the scene with all the lava in the castle and she goes, wow, that looks so realistic. And that was six-year-old me and 26-year-old me. I mm-hmm. still look at that and I'm like, wow, mm-hmm. look at those graphics. Yes. No, admittedly, some some of the graphics don't age that well. Most of most of Fiona's facial expressions are mm-hmm. very uh, wooden. Mm-hmm. Like Pinocchio's are less wooden than hers. Um, but uh, no, and then it. it so for Shrek Two for that that's a better rewatch just because the the the, an, the actual animations themselves are much better. But mm-hmm. again, that's what you get from all of Prince of Egypt's Prince of Egypt's rejects animating the movie too. So oh yeah, I heard someone say once that Shrek Two is the perfect sequel. Yes, yeah, they're like yes, it does everything a good sequel should do. It builds the world, it expands on characters, yeah. and it introduces a new antagonist. That's it. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Scratches all those boxes and also, you know, has one of an absolute certified banger. Oh, yeah. The, the greatest, the greatest example of a cover that's better than the original by far. Um, but actually, again, I love that where we organically got into this track conversation. Um, everyone at home is probably just losing their minds of like, oh, my God, this is going to be a three hour episode. And yes, it is. Strap in. No, um, just the soundtracks in general. Um, man, they were so they were so good at picking very unusual songs for that moment. Mm-hmm. And again, the cover say that there. Are, so there's an, another cover of "Holding Out for a Hero" that plays in the cre- the ending credits. It is also really good. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they got David Bowie on on for Shrek Two. They got Paul McCartney signed up for number three. In fact, one of the greatest failings of the Shrek franchise, in my not so humble opinion about Shrek, the um, Rumpelstiltskin, who was of course the mm-hmm. antagonist of the fourth one. Do you know who originally wanted, who like campaigned to voice the character? No, Sir Paul McCartney. Oh man, he wanted to be. That and one of the storyboard artists that ended up actually voicing him turned it down for some reason because they're like it'll be too distracting because everyone's gonna be like that's Paul McCartney and he's not exactly wrong but also he's wrong when Sir Paul McCartney wants to do something you let him do it he's it's just Sir Paul McCartney yeah. I yeah he's only you know one of the four most mm-hmm. famous musicians of, in the history of music mm-hmm. but John Cleese wasn't distracting I don't know it, yes. <laughs> And also another credit to Shrek the Third, being one of the first uh, projects in a long time that got John Cleese and Eric Idle back mm-hmm. on the same, because there was like a very little little falling out, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, that that brought them back. And uh, also in the Shrek Two commentary as well, um, I'm I'm really just going to retitle this episode. Um, Dustin Shrektacular. Yes. Um, I'll say Destin Richardson and Kate Winoski, a uh, a total train Shrek. Um, that's right, Shrek yourself before you wreck yourself. So um, now. In, yeah. 
The Shrek 2 uh, director's commentary, they actually talk about the Sir Justin poster at the top of Fiona's mm-hmm. bed. And they actually go on record, still to this day, swearing they did not know that at that very moment was when Cameron Diaz and Justin Timberlake were dating. Oh. But that one joke caught up for obvious reasons because, like, he saw the movie, Cameron was in it. Saw that joke. He thought it was very funny. He reached out to them, and that's how he then became the voice of Arthur in the third one, which was the greatest failing of the third one. I mean, oh, it, it, the, the character was rather insufferable, though. Mm-hmm. And he's sure he's a, a nerdy teenager. And I mean, no, no teenager is actually a good person. Mm-hmm. But still, it was. Well, you know what? For the sake of the viewers at home, let's talk. Let's talk about something besides Shrek. So, Kung Fu Panda Two is also. <laughs> It also checks all of those boxes. It's, Character development, world building, and new antagonist. That new antagonist, by the way, Sheng, is amazing. The Gary Oldman went so much harder on that role than he needed to. He was genuinely terrifying. My favorite thing with the Kung Fu, fan, the Kung Fu Panda franchise is the fact that Chinese executives were like, how did we not think of this? We have Kung mm-hmm. Fu. We have pandas. This should have been a slam dunk. How did yes. the Americans beat us to it? Yes. American excellent. And, <coughs> and um, I, I remember um, posting about it a few days ago about like, what's your favorite adult joke? Mm-hmm. In a kid's movie. Now, of the Shrek franchise, my favorite one is not the uh, compensate for something, which, don't get me wrong, is still a great joke, but mm-hmm. my favorite there was the uh, um, the Knights segment. Mm-hmm. The uh, Especially when he pulls the catnip out of Puss's uh, boot, and he's like, that's like, not mine. <laughs> um, the police brutality, the, the pepper the pepper grinder for pepper spray. Again, that. But my favorite adult joke of all time is actually in Kung Fu Panda 2. Okay. It's the scene where they're in jail uh, after kind of giving up on their raid of Shanks Palace mm-hmm. and they get captured and they see like Master Rhino and they see uh, Master Croc in there and they're in their jails and they're all like talking about themselves. And of course they give this joke to Seth Rogen. He might have even he might have even heard it. Who knows? But Mantis says, oh, so this is how we go out. You know, I didn't think it'd be end this way. I always imagined I'd find a nice girl and she'd eat my head. Because one, the obvious fellatio joke there, but mm-hmm. also it's so scientifically accurate to, to the Mantis recycle. Like anytime, uh, anytime that a blowjob joke can also be scientifically accurate, it's a win in my book. Every time. There we go. Um, simple man with simple requests. It, exactly. I'll say, just give me scientifically accurate sex jokes. That's all, all I ask for. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, let's see, Shrek, Kung Fu Panda. We're just working our way through DreamWorks here. Madagascar. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm kidding. Well, Madagascar is one that is... Well, Madagascar 2 is mm-hmm. one that is so ingrained in my psyche. Um, my, my ex, um, she had a at the time we started dating, had a six-month-old son. And for, for anyone listening that, you know, has ever raised a baby or a toddler or an infant, when there's a movie that gets them to shut up and that they enjoy it, you watch that movie on loop for weeks and weeks and weeks. And that movie was Madagascar 2. So, yeah, again, unfortunately, I know I know every word of that movie, but not because I, like, I actively set to learn it. Not like the first Shrek movie where like I learned like every word and to do everyone at all the voices. Mm-hmm. I can't do them now. I got a little bit of like a bronchitis thing going on. Mm-hmm. But in, in proper health, I can do every male character's voice. Pitch perfect. And it is not nearly as impressive to women as you would think it would be. I once went to quite the opposite effect, actually. I once went to an apartment. Uh, party and uh, the person had an oil painting of that scene with Motomoto and my (laughs) friend was like I think we should leave I was like no 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 No, I need to figure out who this person is because they will either be the worst person I've ever met or my new best friend yep I like them big I like them (laughs) children 
Art. Yeah. Girl, you huge. <laughs> I just uh, want to know, like, did they find it in a thrift store or did they commission that? Did they do it themselves? I have so many more questions. Yeah. Um, I was at a I was at a house a couple months ago. It was like a birthday party, and they had like steps going up to like their uh, bedrooms. And I noticed that on the way down, but they had a um, um, they had a live, laugh, love painting, um. But it was just like Skeletor. Beautiful. And him doing all of those things. Um, and then, and then like, as I go through the house, I notice so many more Skeletor focused pieces of artwork. And I, exactly. Already, I'm like, uh, you know, I was going to leave a little earlier. No, I'm sticking around now. Like, mm-hmm. These, mm-hmm. these are good people. If you were to commission a painting on any piece of IP, what do you think it would be? Because mine, I would love to get an oil painting of a $5 crunch box from Taco Bell to put in my living room. I think that cuts to who I am as a person. I respect that wholeheartedly. Um, Mine is, so in in my guest room, um, I I didn't show you, uh, I can't after the the podcast, I have two pieces of true art. Um, One of them is my face photoshopped over Gimli from Lord of the Rings. Beautiful. And the other one... And he's not, even, he's not my favorite uh, in Lord of the Rings, but I mean, I, I, I love it. And I didn't do this, by the way. I, I need to be very clear. I didn't commission these. My dad did these because he was just really bored at work one day. Um, Boss makes a dollar, I make a dime. Yeah. I make memes on company Th- time. This, he, <laughs> This was like seven or eight years ago now. I'm sure the Statue of Limitations is, is good. Um, and then the other one is me over, like, the you know, like the Merlin show? Mm-hmm. Me over Lancelot oh. as well. So it's just my face photoshopped. So I want to have my piece de resistance in the guest room. And I mm-hmm. want it to be on the ceiling over the bed so that when my guest wakes up, the first thing they see is this giant sprawling mural. <laughs> Of my face photoshopped. Have you ever seen mm-hmm. the movie Dodgeball? Yes, I have. My face photoshopped over White Goodman grabbing the bull by the horns. <laughs> I want that to be the first how thing would that, how, how would no one ever feel welcome? That exactly. makes everybody feel as welcome as possible. Exactly. Like, yeah, gaze upon your, your wondrous host. Um, <clears throat> that one's going to cost a lot, too. And, like, it being on the ceiling as well, like, I had to like pay some artists like a week's residence almost mm-hmm. um, while they're up there, like like uh, with the Sistine Chapel, like get them like like a scaffolding thing so they can like be laying on their back, like painting on the ceiling. I'll be like the Pope. I'll have like my papal staff. I'll be like jabbing. I'll be like faster, faster. I had a coworker was telling me one time that their I think their great aunt. <clears throat> has a has a room with all of her collectible dolls in it, uh-huh. and that also is the guest room, which oh. is an intersection of a Venn Vi- oh. diagram. I would never uh-huh. never want to be a part of. Yeah. But apparently, she has turned all the dolls to face the bed. Which who <laughs> thought you could get it even worse than how it already is? Oh, she does not that. have company. I love that, <laughs> and and I love that because I have been on the wrong end of that. Um, when I, again, once I, when I was in Med's Chorus at BG, we were on a, uh, we were on like a tour. I can't remember. Or no, no, but actually, no, this wasn't through Med's Chorus. This was through Acapella Choir, but also still BG. We we're on our way to Chicago. So our first homestay was somewhere in the greater Cincinnati area. We had a gig there first before we then went through Indiana. But wherever this was in Cincinnati, and it was, it was like, we saw like this brand new like neighborhood, but then we were staying at the one old house before they started building the new neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So you see like this, this modern cookie cutter suburbia, but then there's like this one very creepy ominous house in front of it. And that's where we stayed. Naturally. And our room was upstairs and there was four like life-size dolls in the room that I was there. And one of them like, I, I remember I, I was in there. 
I went to the other room just to hang out and talk with them. I came back and there was only three dolls. Yep. <laughs> Did someone think that they were going to be I, I clever? Hope, I hope. <laughs> just just going to place this in the shower. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I'm, I'm hoping it was that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, and, and like, yeah, dolls are just creepy in general. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, I mean, just taxidermy in any form, too, is also very weird to me, even though I, I have, like, a, a great new bit about taxidermy. So I'm not going to dive too much into it. But mm -hmm. um, it, now, one, I, I will just so my parents, even though my, my mom's first husband, he hunted. My, my, my current, my, my dad, he doesn't. Mm -hmm. But my mom's first husband, he did hunt briefly. And so in my house, uh, at our, our landing, the way you, when you'd walk into the house, there was three deer mm -hmm. mounted on the, the walls. And two of them, he he killed himself. But the third one, that deer killed itself. Oh my. Yes. I thought, well, oh my God. I, I was in high school and my mom like told me the story behind this deer. Like, rock my world. Uh, so the, he saw the deer hop, like to like you know not get run over by the car, obviously, because mm -hmm. and it leapt off of a bridge, and it like its back leg got. He saw the back leg got caught, and like the deer fell mm -hmm. and like broke its neck immediately on impact. And I don't, and I guess my my I guess because it was. Uh, there was, there was no like bullet holes or anything. He's like, this is a well preserved carcass. He would get it mounted as well because mm -hmm. it was a, a clean kill. And I'm just like, why are you celebrating this emo deer? Like, <laughs> you're such a G. Just <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm like, don't don't worry about it. Take that one down. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Take that one down. My parents, uh, growing up, they had no real taxidermy, but they had some stuffed taxidermy. So it was like a it looked like some kind of plush bear head mounted on the wall, which deeply upset child me because I thought that he had killed a teddy bear and put <laughs> it on the wall. <laughs> so you monsters. You just gave me a great idea for my guest room, though. <laughs> <laughs> like, go to build a bear and get, like, the bear. Heads only, they please. Have. But then, yeah, and then as soon as I do it, I'm like, all right, head only. And I hand the rest of it back to them, like, here you go. Take this to the processing plant. Do with it right, what you right. wish. Recycle it. Let it live to see another day. A friend of mine in high school worked at Build a Bear, and she was she was like, "I'll let you in on a little secret. When we have the kids fill the bears, and we're like, oh yeah, no, like jump and like rub the you know rub them on your heart or whatever.' She's like, I make that shit up every single time. <laughs> it's different every single time. It is just whatever I am feeling. And if that kid is really irritating me, I will make them do ridiculous tasks for several minutes. <laughs> like you gotta uh, carry it on your back up the mountain of the water that flows uphill. <laughs> and even the kids will be like, oh I don't I don't want the Madame Zeroni occur. So like I'm like I don't want to be I don't want to be like Shia LaBeouf. No one should want to be like Shia LaBeouf. Uh, but um, so I guess we we've talked so much about DreamWorks. Let's 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 mm -hmm. pivot. Let's pivot into Disney here. Um, have you been to Disneyland? I've not. I've not been to Disneyland or Disney World. My so I'm the oldest of four siblings. And there's six years between me and my youngest brother. And growing up, I was like, will we ever go to Disney, Dad? And he's like, well, after the youngest is potty trained. We're not doing diapers at Disney. And I was like, oh, okay, That's, that makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, he was eventually potty trained. And I was like, Dad, are we ever going to go to Disney? He's like, well, now you're too old and it's not going to be very fun. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's almost as if we were never going to go to Disney. <laughs> yeah. I see the Jedi mind trick you're trying to pull right now. We were very much a state fair kind of people. <laughs> that was more the vibe. Yeah. Have you been? Uh, yes, I was when I was four. Mm -hmm. And I had a chance to go last week. Oh, wow. And unfortunately, well, 
I remember like I was supposed to have all of next week off and I was like trying to push for it to go then because mm-hmm. I, I have a, a nephew he's uh nine so like it would have been the perfect age for him because he'd remember it I don't remember anything from when I was four mm-hmm. um but I uh yeah it had it worked out but then I remember like I used too much vacation earlier in the year so I was like I had to clip a couple days short mm-hmm. and I need to preserve the back half but yeah so it didn't work out and I mean, my, my parents took like 300 pictures and the whole time they're like, you remember this? You remember this? I'm like, no, cause I was four. <laughs> but, um, you know what? I, I actually went, um, back in 2018. So within my first year of doing stand up, I actually went to Tampa and I did a week there, um, visiting a family friend, but also I did open mics and, and clubs while I was down there. And the, the one Wednesday night uh, was the one night that the host family was like, you need to find somewhere else. We need that room mm-hmm. for other people. And I was even just like, okay, cool, whatever. I was like, might be Swingers night. Who am I to judge? You guys have been great host to me. I, I have no right to, mm-hmm. to complain. And so that Wednesday night, I hit up um, my best friend's roommate from OSU and – I was like, hey, I know we barely know each other, but I know you live in Orlando now. Let me crash on your couch. <laughs> and he was even like, yeah, sure, okay. And I was like, and then I'm also doing, a, I'm doing an open mic at the Orlando Improv. <laughs> and so, you know, I went, I did that. and But on the way there, because I, it was only about, I don't know, hour, 15 minute drive from Tampa to Orlando. <laughs> but I drove right past Disneyland. And I went there to, I, I was like, this would be so funny if I tell people, yeah, I went to Disneyland just to pee and then leave back, heading back to Orlando. Truly the mind of the comedian. Exactly. <laughs> this I'm, would be so funny like if I do most, this thing. I was like, the most magical place on earth, and I'm just going to use it as a pit stop. Exactly. I'm like, that, that's like so starkly hilarious. And I get there, and uh, freaking Disney pulled another joke on me because I forgot that the moment you cross into Disney property, everything is twenty dollars, <laughs> including parking. <laughs> so I'm like, God damn it! So I had to pay twenty dollars for my stupid joke that only a few people found funny. <laughs> I'm like, this is a, a terrible investment in my comedy. And then also, I was even like, well, you know what? Since I am here, I can I can lie about maybe popping into Epcot and like going to like the like the the bar mm-hmm. there and then it's like oh yeah to get in there that's an extra hundred i'm like okay no. i'm not willing to pay a hundred dollars for a joke so not yet <laughs> we've not we, yet. we found our cost benefit analysis yes yeah twenty dollars is the most i was willing to pay for a joke at that point in my comedy career <laughs> um, here in a couple of years i might be able to spend a hundred dollars to like make oh joke. man i knew destin when he could only afford twenty dollars <laughs> <jokes. laughs> I have, a, I have a friend that swears that their poor understanding of geography comes from when they went to Disney World and they went to Epcot and all the countries were next to each other and they were also intermixed with places like the Hundred Acre Woods. So they're like, <laughs> Japan isn't real. <laughs> it would have been even funnier if it was Taiwan because then it's like, oh, well, China actually would love that joke. Okay. Uh, I, you know, so now part of me wants to like see if I can't do a hundred dollar joke uh, after my special in January. Like that should be my way of celebrating because, like, you know, after everyone like wins like the Super Bowl or whatever, they're like, I'm going to Disneyland. So I should, I should do that. I'll end my special by like, I'm going to Disney World and see if I can't make a hundred dollar joke there. Beautiful. They go for a week, see if I can't make my hundred dollar joke. Then also, so like Orlando's kind of close to Fort Lauderdale. I'll, I have a friend down there, you know pop in and say hi to him. And then I found out online that between Fort Lauderdale and Miami, that there is an island in Florida inhabited solely by raccoons. And Go I will, on. And I will get my rabies shots. I will go down there and I will pet all of the raccoons. All of them. I was going to say, I think that joke's even free. I think you don't even have to pay to do that joke. (laughs) 
nothing nothing would please me more uh given my current mental health than to go to a a, a island of raccoons and feed them trash and 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 pet them and get bitten because mm-hmm. they're like cats in the way that they only like being petted for like maybe five min- five seconds at a time and then it's immediately violence I would be the worst person alive and I would give them cotton candy so they go to wash it and it dissolves. How dare you? Do that to animals that deserve it, like cats. Or like, other... Don't do that to trash pandas. Why would you do that? Exactly. Leave my trash pandas alone. I say, like, if only there was, the, like, now I just want to like, find places that have all these, like, Discussing Midwestern animals that you can go and like play with. Because like after I go to Raccoon Island, next up, Possum Farm. When I was living in Chicago, I went to the Lincoln Park Zoo with a few of my classmates, <coughs> many of whom were just born and raised Chicago area. There were cows as a zoo exhibit. And they're like, wow, I've never seen I've never seen cows before. And I just had to go, we live such a different lives. Yeah. How have you never seen a cow before? It was an exotic experience for them. Yeah. Um, but no, uh, I say, but I, I hate that I'm almost to the point I think raccoons have taken over as my favorite animal because for all my life it's been penguins. But like peng- penguins are, are they're, they're on the edge. Like they're, they need to step their game up. It's been a while. The, you know, Morgan Freeman hasn't done any voice work for him lately. Mm-hmm. Um, Whichever PR firm is representing penguins. Yeah, exactly. The penguins set the game up. I mean, we got, we got a little bit of, of Penguin in uh, the Batman movie that happened mm-hmm. recently. Not enough. That Cobblepot show better. Like my like Penguin's number one uh, status as my favorite animal is resting solely on the, the shoulders of Colin Farrell and HBO right now. So it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> my favorite animal is the manatee. Um, Hell yes. And uh, that was because that was the animal that I saw. There's a picture of me somewhere. I was like three or four at the Columbus Zoo. Bucket hat, overalls, very like 1998. Uh, just like looking up at this seemingly majestic creature. Mm-hmm. Nice. <laughs> it was beautiful. Loved him ever since. No. Um, yeah, I, I say I do love, I love, I love a lot of the aquatic animals. Uh, that being said, I'm terrified of the ocean. Absolutely. Humans don't belong in the ocean. If you are, you're just asking for death. That's except now by if you're in the ocean long enough, you're salt brining yourself and you're making yourself even more tasty. That's, that's all you're doing. Why would you voluntarily pickle yourself? Exactly. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, not not a huge fan. I yeah. mean, I've I've but I've yet to find a mammal that I didn't like. That's it, to quote one of my friends, um, if not friend, then why friend shaped? <laughs> yes. I think bears are the worst offender. Absolutely adorable. Oh why? God. Why are they so deadly when their ears are like yes. this? Yes. <laughs> God and, is cruel. And, and 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 yeah, like I mean, we're growing up with teddy bears, and it's like yeah, teddy bears are adorable. The Care Bears, Teddy Ursa mm-hmm. from Pokemon, like all of these very cute examples of bears. Uh, Poe. Mm-hmm. Full circle Sorry. here. Full yep. circle. Um. But yeah, no, bears are, again, to quote Stephen Colbert, godless killing machines. So. Um, I actually went my sophomore year in English. Uh, we, I don't know why, but we had to, like, a project was to, like, make up a charity. Oh, okay. And, like, make your own, like, uh, pamphlet for them, make, like, a whole PR campaign and all that. So yeah, for a week we you know did nonprofit organization fraud is what we were doing. I was gonna say you just your teacher followed a Seinfeld A plot. Yes. <laughs> made up a charity. Yes. For a made up holiday. Speaking of December twenty-third, uh, I'm kidding. This will air after that. But um so we did save the bears. Beautiful. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And I, I designed this shirt. It was like one of my bigger contributions. So on the front was this terrifying bear. Um, and ah, it was this terrifying bear. And it just said, uh, you better save the bears, exclamation point. Like as in like, you better save them. And on the back, 
cutest teddy bear ever holding a balloon for a bearable future. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that assignment sounds unbearable. Oh. <laughs> oh. And with the huge pause there. Well, uh, unfortunately, actually, uh, I have to wrap it up here. Um, so uh, tell all the viewers uh, at home where they can follow you, where they can support you. Absolutely. Uh, best place would be Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Um, I am Caitlin Minoski on Facebook. Um, Instagram, I am C Minoski. And TikTok, I am Caitlin.comedy. Awesome. Well, thank you again for coming. Uh, it's been a great conversation. We'll uh, talk more about DreamWorks and Disney uh, <laughs> at a later time. Have a good night.